Welcome to the Startup Grind. Uh, let me introduce Jason. He needs no introduction. You're, you're worldwide. You're I'd global. like one, but, but let, I let don't me need one. Let me give it. Let me give it. No, 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 no. It's too embarrassing. You, you don't? No, no, I'm, yeah. de no I'm definitely going to give it. Jason is a seasoned entrepreneur. I wrote this myself. It's really it's right. beautiful. <laughs> With a multi-exit track record that includes Silicon Alley Reporter, which he founded in 1996 and sold in 2001. You can clap if you like any of these products. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people were around for that Web uh, 1.0. That's true. Venture Does anyone, anybody remember Silicon Alley Reporter? Was anybody part of Web 1.0? It's so funny. I had a whole career before this. He does. Where like I had a magazine that was going out to 100,000 people that made 12 million dollars a year about the internet. Like, does anybody remember Red Herring or Upside? Yeah. A couple yeah, of people. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's sort of like that for New York. <laughs> okay, VentureReporter.net. Yep. Anybody remember that? Sold to Dow Jones. Yeah, sold to Dow Jones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what year was that? 2002. -ish, 2002. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Database of venture capital transactions. And then, of course, Weblogs, founded in 2003, acquired yeah. by AOL in 2006. Uh, everyone familiar with Weblogs? Engadget? Autoblog? Yeah. Joystick? Yeah. Autoblog? Joystick? Yeah. Uh, Jason's now the CEO of Mahalo.com, based in Santa Monica. Avid angel investor with investments in companies like Uber, Gowalla, Reportive, uh, Uber Media, Chartbeat, and many more. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, uh, just as we get started here, uh, would love to kind of talk about here a little bit about your background and then all the you know, the really cool things that you're doing right now, like the launch conference, Mahalo's, yeah. you know, recent kind of shift and all the yeah. things surrounding that. Um, I love this summary that you wrote of yourself online, um, which is two th uh, 1995, I was nobody. 2000, I was a media titan. 2003, I was nobody. 2005, I was a media titan. 2007, nobody. 2011, question mark. Yeah, that's um, pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Never uh, take yourself too seriously. Right. As a matter of fact, I'm becoming a pariah in the industry again. Why is that? Uh, I think the breakup with Mike at TechCrunch is now leading to some factions. So the TechCrunch writers have been banned from writing about the startups that launch, which I'm really brokenhearted about, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it would seem to me that that would play so negatively on them. I mean, what, 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 like, what is even the, the the advantage for TechCrunch to do something like that? I mean, it seems you'd have to ask them. I, I mean, I literally have begged the reporters, like, let's not. I know it's personal between Mike and I, but. Is there a way we can just forget about it for two days so that these people who are having their launch can get coverage? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm inviting you. Come. You know, like, I know Mike and I are in a lawsuit, but do the 40 companies have to suffer? And I sort of feel like it's my fault, and these companies are suffering because of me, and it's, it's very complicated. I mean, I saw, I saw but that being said, I'm busting my ass for them, and I've been up here for two weeks, and I'm going to be back next week helping them rehearse, and I am going to help them all raise funding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invest in as many as I can, and uh, it's redoubled my commitment to helping them become successful. Because, you know, I, I was always an outsider and an underdog, and that's what I have love for. And so I kind of like being an outsider and an underdog, to be honest. It's like you get something to rise up above, mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, I guess a lot of people know me in the industry as, like, an insider or, like, somebody who's really well networked, but... I don't like that feeling, actually. I liked it better when I had to fight my way up. Yeah. So I, I just still feel like a fighter, you know? And I kind of like it. It's like it's giving me a new challenge. Like, okay, if TechCrunch is going to screw these companies, it's my fault, then I got to make it right. And so I'm just going to fight to make it right. If that means I have to launch a TechCrunch competitor. You know, I do launch the newsletter, but I, my intention wasn't to make it a blog. But if they're not going to cover them, then maybe I need to make it a blog and go head to head. And I mean, do you feel like, I mean, is there no way to kind of go through backdoor channels and try and resolve it. Maybe you've been trying to resolve it, but it feels like to me like, you know, you... There have you been a lot on, of backdoors. If, if you put it out on Twitter, <laughs> that's pretty much you saying, there's no way this is going to get resolved, but people should know the truth, you know, because... Like this has been an issue for a month, and we're a week out from the conference, and, you know, I don't know if people watch, you know, on Twitter you don't see people asking, at Jason, why are the TechCrunch writers not coming? But I've got 40 companies you know, on stage, and then you may know I have like a launch pad, <coughs> which is called Demo Pit in the TechCrunch 50 Days, where I've given a bunch of people free tables who need them, or given steep discounts. I mean, I'm running the conference at a loss, and yeah. I may break even, and if it does make money, I'm investing it in the companies. Yeah. So my idea is to disrupt, to use a word, <laughs> the entire <laughs> conference industry. <laughs> um, it's a Clayton Christensen word, right? It's not a yeah. word. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, listen, I like to fuck with things, and people, and bullies. And uh, you know, I felt the demo conference was a bully, and that's Mike and I had 
dinner one night at the Sundance uh, Steakhouse down on El Camino. Is it real or real? Real. real. Yeah, real. 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 El Camino, real. keeping real. it real. Um, and uh, that's where the whole concept of TechCrunch 40 and 50 came from, was that night when we had dinner, was Steve Gilmore was there. And when and was that? That was, wow, 2004 maybe? Huh. Two, 2000, when did I raise the so money? The first 2006. Year was 2007. So yeah, it was so 2006, the I was on Sand Hill Road uh, pitching the idea of Mahalo and meeting with Sequoia. Yeah. And we were going to dinner, and I, I told Mike about it. And I said, Mike, you know, this TechCrunch thing, you're running out of your house with three writers, and he was writing half the blog post. You know, you need to do an event. People love TechCrunch. This is when Mike was a really good writer, you know, not writing this sort of silly stuff. I mean, he's a brilliant guy, and he's a, good, he's a really good writer when he's not writing about his baggage being lost. Um, and uh, he asked, you know, well, that's Mike. Um, he, so he said, well, how do you do that? And I said, well, you start a conference, and, um, you know, you just have to come up with a format. And he said, well, what format? And I said, well, you know this demo conference? He goes, yeah, that, it sucks, right? And I'm like, yeah, they, you know they charge people? He said, oh, they charge people? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, it's like, that's payola, right? And I said, yeah, we should do a conference. I said, you should do a conference that doesn't charge people. And they get picked for the stage based on merit, not their ability to pay $20,000 for six minutes. And he goes, oh, that's a brilliant idea. And Steve said, do it with them. And I said, I'm too busy. I'm doing this Mahalo thing. It's going to be really big. Um, human powered search. It's going to change everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried. And so he, um, he said, do it with me. And I said, I'm too busy. He said, come on, do it with me. I said, OK. So we started a company together. We actually started an LLC, and we did it together for three years. I'm very proud of the work we did. Um, but you know, it's, that's two big elephants in one t small china shop, mm -hmm. which is basically two elephants too many. Um, and it didn't work out for whatever reasons. I mean, he basically didn't want to do it with me anymore. Um, but it was started with distinct uh, purpose of killing the demo conference. Mm -hmm. We both really didn't like that concept of preying upon startups. And you know, I think when you're an underdog like I grew up, and also sort of how I grew up in the industry, you, it you don't ever lose it. You know, it's like it's it's my DNA to fight and to fight for the underdog because that's me. Mm -hmm. And just like I destroyed the demo conference, and everybody here knows it's a waste of money, and you would never do it, and it's for people who can't get on stage based on merit. And I'm not that's not a dig to those companies. That's just the reality. The companies we turn down are instantly accepted by demo mm -hmm. because they can pay. And actually, the bad companies use that as leverage. Oh, we got accepted to demo. I'm like, yeah. yes. So with this check, you know, like without even knowing what it is. Um, Jason, even before Chris Shipley didn't lead it anymore? Or no, back in those days, when actually when Stuart Alsop did it, right. they, they charged, it was kind of interesting, because Stu, I'm friends with Stuart Alsop, we play poker together, and Stuart's a really great guy and a visionary, and he said, you know, when we started charging, it was just to like sort of pay for the tables, or whatever, and it was like $2,000. It was just sort of like share costs kind of a thing. And I was like, no. Oh. I was like, when did it go wrong? I was like, well, they sold it to IGG, and IDG is like this multi-billion dollar publishing company, and it's just like, let's churn it out. Let's get 70 companies to pay 20 grand each. And hey, that adds up pretty quick, right? It's a pretty good business model, $1.4 million. Um, is that what it is? Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of money. Wait a second, I got to change the business model. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I feel like we succeeded with that. And I feel like it was the same thing with the Koretsu Forum, which some, has anybody ever been to a Koretsu Forum? Has any, was it good? <laughs> Did anybody ever pay <laughs> to present at a Koretsu Forum? You know, that, that was the same thing. It's like this company preying upon startups, people who are naive, you know, first timers. Oh, the way you meet angel investors is you pay them to see, hear your pitch? I mean, if that's the case, I'd be a billionaire right now. <laughs> I'd be Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> if I got paid for every angel pitch. I'm going to hear like six when I go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, like when I'm at the urinal, I hear two. Well, we, we have ropes to tie you down, so you have to listen to I don't mind it. I, I got love for, my, for people pitching and hustling because that's all I do. That's my day. I hustle every day. I mean, I mean TechCrunch 50 to me, uh, I, so I, was at, I worked at EA at the time, and uh, I mean, literally, I would like cancel meetings for three days, right? Yep. And, and it was like, uh, you know, it was the one time I was like pumped to have the high cubes. Yeah. You know, because like no one, you no know, one would bother me. I just, oh, I'm, I'm, bu I'm building a PowerPoint. You know, yeah. and and I'm just glued to the, to glued to the screen. Yeah. And it was, and and I talked to uh, Ethan Anderson, who's the founder of Red Beacon. Yeah, great guy. And he said immediately. I mean, this was before we knew you were going to speak. He said, I was talking to him about TechCrunch 50. He's like, you know, Jason was this huge force for us in getting ready for it in the presentations yeah. and you know prepping us and asking her questions and getting us lined up where they eventually won. Yeah. And uh, you know, little I mean, known fact. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I think you know your role in that was, you know, I mean, it was felt by the guys that won and, and the guys that mattered. And yeah. And, uh, yeah. We um, we did rehearsals with them, and I score the rehearsals, and I won't let anybody go on stage without an eight, but I won't let them drop out either. 
which is sort of like my dad told me in the military they had a thing where like when they would go on these 10 mile runs the he he was the guy in the back of the run and that they gave him a stick mm. and his job was very really slow down and hit him with the stick <laughs> and make sure that they finished because if the if everybody didn't finish everybody had to do more and do more push-ups so I sort of feel like I got to coach them a little bit, and then sometimes it's a little bit of a stick, and you gotta, you guys got to get your numbers up. I f it's mandatory two rehearsals, even if you're great, and then it's a third and a fourth. So Monday and Tuesday would be the third and fourth for some people. It's so awesome though, to watch companies go from like having a great presentation, um, having a great product but a terrible presentation, to having both a great presentation and a great product. And, mm -hmm. um, that's the most rewarding part for me. That's the reason I do it. I mean, this is an, extra I mean, an extraordinary amount of effort and money and time and listen I made a lot of money over the three years of TechCrunch Shift is very successful on a financial basis so I'm not complaining um, and I didn't need the money mm -hmm. but then after a while I just thought wow I could fuck with this whole conference space even more <laughs> um, what if I made the conference accessible to everybody because I went to South by Southwest in 1999 with Doug Rushkoff when I was a journalist and I think there were three tracks and about 500 people at South by Southwest mm -hmm. And everybody there was a journalist. Everybody there had, had a speaking gig. There were panels of eight people, six, seven, eight people per panel, because that was the mm -hmm. only way they could get people to come to Austin for the interactive. This is like the second year, I think, 99. And if you look up on their website, you'll see 1999, Cal Canis, Rushkoff. It's funny, because mm -hmm. they have all the alumni speakers. And when I went back 10 years later in 2009, it's 5,000 people there. Mm -hmm. And I said, how do they do this? Oh, you know, the, um, they made it affordable. It's 450 bucks. It's, it's between 450 and 800 bucks. And you know, when you're CEO of a company, you can buy a ticket to anything at any time. You take out your corporate card. But if you're a developer, I know because my developers come to me, hey, can I go to this PHP conference? I want to go to DjangoCon. I'm like, what? How much is it? 99 cents? Mm -hmm. And you've got to take a $99 Southwest? What are you doing? This is crazy. You know? <laughs> uh, you're going to take two days off from work? And you know, like, CEOs are always jerks about that. You know, like they never want to let you go to any event. You ha you know, and they, God forbid it cost anything. Right. You know? and so, but I give it as a reward now because I realize Actually, if you give that as a reward to your best people, um, they really appreciate it. Um, and this, that's one of the major ways the launch is disruptive and different, right? So cheap. You're, you're, it's cheap. It's cheap. It's really cheap. It's cheap. It's basically, there's, there's, there's like three pricing levels. It's $1,000 if you're not a, a bootstrap startup. And bootstrap startup, I think we defined as like under a couple of million dollars in uh, fundraising. It's $400 if you are a regular startup or 10 to 25% less if you follow my Twitter account and watch the discount codes I put out or read my email newsletter. So it's basically 300 and some odd dollars. Pretty cheap, 360s, yeah. Um, and if you get the 25% of course, it's only 300. Or there's a third way, which is if you email me and write me a sob story and say you love my newsletter and my writing and that my tweets are hysterical, <laughs> <laughs> or that you like my bulldogs, or you think that you, or you love Tyler's insights on This Week in Startups, whatever it is. Anybody watch This Week in Startups? It's always amazing me that a lot of people watch this week in startups. I'm always wondering, who are those 99,000 people downloading it? Um, it's like 100,000 downloads now. Uh, so, you know, the conference looks like it's going to be in the black. I thought I was going to lose about $150,000 on it, yeah. which um, luckily is not that big of a deal for me. But um, now it's going to be probably break even or profitable. Um, and that means I'm going to take whatever the profits are and invest them in the companies. Yeah. And that's just fucking with everything. And all these other conference producers are just like, I mean, this is a reason why I'm hated. Uh, <laughs> because I do crazy shit that makes people in positions of power a little bit upset, you know, and it really pisses them off that I'm now lowering the ticket prices and showing you can have an event with the top speakers and I can do it at a loss or break even. And if it makes money, I'm going to invest it in the companies. So demo charging 20,000, TechCrunch 50 charging nothing, launch conference, I pay you. That's my strategy. That's, that's pretty strong. It's pretty insane. That's pretty strong. Yeah. Um, and then I just like, you know, some people are on Hacker News where I, I love Hacker News because it's like, there's like all these sort of Calacanis fanboys and then there are people who really hate me, like SEOs and stuff. <laughs> so I always love just participating in the threads. But like today I was like, I was talking to the companies who were there and uh, at the, who were doing the rehearsals and I was like, what's the number one thing you guys need? And they're like, venture capital, angel investing. And I said, okay, I got that covered. I invited every open angel forum member for free. I opened. I got a bunch of the VCs to come. Some paid. Some some people. I'm like, I'm shaming them now. I've got somebody on my personal email account <laughs> emailing um, groups of VCs at firms that don't have anybody coming. Mm -hmm. So they're like, t getting all six or seven members of their internet team and emailing them from my account this form letter that I wrote, which is like, 
is nobody from Kleiner Perkins coming? <laughs> wow, my goodness, we, you have to come see these 40 amazing companies that are going to change the world and the 60 and the thing. Will, will nobody come as my guest? Yeah. Please, just hit reply and we'll give you a ticket. And they're all like replying. And then I'm like eating dim sum and I have this on the email and they're just doing it to every VC firm. <laughs> I'm so smart sometimes with marketing. This is my gift. <laughs> and so they all think like they're like some special VC firm that's getting this email. I'm doing it to every motherfucking one. <laughs> and I'm going to get every motherfucking VC there. <laughs> and then I'm like, and of course, you're coming to the VIP party. And they're like, so now they're all responding like, is there room in the VIP party? I'm like, of course there is for you, Morgan Thaler. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's good. Well, let, I mean, I I in terms of some of these other startups, my, one of my questions or concerns with launch events in general is, you know, like, why don't we see a Quora at a launch event? Or do we? You know, what, why don't, would Dig, well, would, would Kevin Rose have, have launched at launch? Or would, would Jason Kalkanis, yeah. would he have launched at launch? I would love to launch at one of my events, but um, I always, uh, you know, never did that temptation because I always felt like the event was for those companies launching. And this was where Mike and I disagreed, you know, in a couple of places. This was a big one. Um, he wanted to have Carol Bartz there. He wanted to have Tim Armstrong there. He wanted to have Angel Gate there. He wanted to have all these things. And I said, Mike, you're, we're both journalists here. There's only a certain number of words a writer can write. Any writers in the audience? Nobody? No journalists? No writers? Good, I can talk freely. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, when you're a writer, you have a certain number of words you can write every day, just like a coder has a certain number of lines of code they can write every day before it just all starts to blur. Yeah. And I said, Mike, if we have these great you know, bloggers and writers in the audience, and they're covering the companies, they, they're only going to write three blog posts. And once you have Carol Bartz tell you, fuck you, or you have the Angel Gate thing, or this thing, or you know, whatever the, you know, Tim buying TechCrunch, all these different things become the headline. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want the headline to be us. I want the headline to be them. This is their moment. And so he's like, what is Mahalo going to do at launch? And I said, nothing. We we're going to have no presence you know, at, at um, TechCrunch 50. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, maybe we'll put something in the put a, We put a little hat, a little baseball cap in the thing. But that was it. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's where Disrupt sort of, you know, went down the wrong path, which is, one, you've got the startups battling each other, which that's not really how the industry works. They shouldn't have to fight each other. Everybody can win. It's not a zero-sum game. And also, why does, you know, Mike have to get in a fight with Carol Bartz at that event? Like, fight at another event, you know, and then just leave this one for the startups. So at, at launch, it will be those 40 startups and, and them only, um, and they'll be the center of attention. And, yeah. the, and also the ones in the demo pit, we're going to, the launch pad, we call it, um, with the cocktail tables. You might have seen on Hacker News, I was like, are there any 10 companies here that would like to get a free table? Because I was like, I, I asked Mike, I was like, how big is the space? How many tables do you have? They're like, oh, we have like over 100 tables. So I was like, well, who's going to get all these tables? And, you know, oh, you know, how much do they cost? So that's like, like, you know, a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars. If you prorate the internet, we spend a hundred thousand on the internet to fill the space. Like it's, right. you know, uh, winds up being like a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars for each table. Um, and I was like, I'm just going to give away 10 on Core and 10 on Hacker News and just blow some people's minds. Yeah. You know, these people were like, wait, wait, what's the catch? And I'm like, the catch is you have to kick ass. <laughs> and they're like, we can do that. And I said, great, come to the event and meet some VCs and get some promotion. Yeah, that's awesome. Nobody's luckier. I mean, there are people luckier than me, but, you know, I feel very lucky. Yeah. You know, I like, and so if I can pass it, you know, pay it forward and pass it on, I feel like that's my giri, you know, the... Japanese word for uh, oh, I think you're honor. Giri. No, my giri, G I R I. It's like uh, your honor to it's your duty. It's yeah. like duty. It's a deep seated duty. Yeah, it's I mean, my duty to help other entrepreneurs because I'm a lot of people help me. There's there are so many you know organizations that are or there are so few organizations that you know really entrepreneur or founder focused. Like I think AngelList is a good example of this right awesome. now. Like just they're just following the it because. Awesome. Like, uh, I mean, I don't know those guys, but they're just doing it because it, they think it's a good thing to do. And, like, people, you know, that's going to come back. I mean, call karma, call it the right thing to do, call it whatever you want. I think, you know, if Launch can, can you know, if you can, you know, duplicate what you, what you did at TechCrunch 50 and bring that into Launch, it, it can, you know, from what you're saying, what you're explaining, like, it's clear to say, as a founder, for me to say, wow, that seems like this guy's got my best interest at heart, which, you know, it will hard exceed, to see. It will exceed what we've done at TechCrunch 50. Clearly exceeded. I mean, based on the, the companies at TechCrunch 50 were legendary. I mean, Mint, PowerSet, mm -hmm. TripIt, um, all sold for over $100 million. Um, and um, 
Yammer raised 50 and could sell easily for hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, we picked a mm -hmm. lot of good winners in that group. Yeah. Uh, and this group is no different. There are a couple of startups here that will get sold for a couple of hundred, will get sold for over nine figures. Um, and so it, it's going to kick ass. And also, it's going to be more inclusive. Um, Deve as I was saying before, you know, like a lot of people who actually do the work in the industry at these events, sort of like very CEO focused or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool, like to <coughs> get some developers there or some product managers and just have some people who actually build shit for once at an event. You know, like I, I, I tell you, I go to all these CEO conferences and man, they're all full of shit. You know, it's just like, <laughs> well, I mean, you don't need to have me on stage to talk about Mahalo or like that. I could tell you in 10 seconds what we do. But these guys are always on stage with this bullshit press releases and they don't ever say anything as publicly traded <laughs> CEOs. They just talk about like, they yeah, dance. it's our company. They dance. Yeah, and they just, they, there's nothing of substance. <laughs> there's an inverse correlation between how much money you've made and um, how much you speak freely. Yeah. Unless you have like a gene like I have or Mark Cuban has where you just don't throttle yourself, it's, you know. It's like a sort of Tourette's. It's like success Tourette's. <laughs> <laughs> the more successful you have, the more you don't give a shit about what you say. Well, to me, uh, you know, we, I, I was talking to Spencer earlier, and we were, we were saying, what, how, what, who would we compare Jason to in the industry, like, you know, a good parallel? And uh, the, one, the one that, uh, I don't know if he agreed with it, but, you know, to me, you're like... Ricky Schroeder? You no, know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you're like the 50 cent of the tech industry. Right? I like that. Like, <laughs> what is that? Didn't he get like, shot? Like, uh, you know, like, <laughs> produces good stuff, pisses everybody off. No right? doubt. No doubt. And, uh, and uh, but, in the in, it, but at the end of the day, you know, you still got, you do good, do good work, you know? So I think... Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm misunderstood sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> But, but you I haven't been shot, right? Have you? Not yet. It yeah. feels like I'm getting close. You're not wearing a bulletproof vest. And <laughs> so if I could tell you the stuff going on this week, you would be amazed. Well, that's a rumor I heard is that when you get off the plane, you know, you go into the bathroom right before you get in San Francisco, you put on the bulletproof no, vest. No doubt. <laughs> you know. And let me tell you, it's illegal to wear one, so it's like I'm fucked either way. Fought, you know, 911's pulling me over, or I'm going to get shot. I lose either way. No, actually, if I could tell you what I've gone through this week in terms of the backhanded back table, back room dealing stuff that's going on to try to take me down. You would, it would make for a cloak and dagger novel. Mm -hmm. Can it you would tell us without naming names? No. Are but you going to write a book sometime? I am. You're going to go on Oprah? No, I'm going to write a book and people are going to be, I'm, I actually know what I'm going to do because I have every email and I am going to write a book someday, maybe <laughs> 10 years from now. And each chapter is going to start with an email. <laughs> you, and each email is going to be from somebody saying, you motherfucker, I am going to end your career. How dare you, blah, blah, blah. Isn't it this. amazing what people write in emails? I, I have so many great legendary emails from people pissed off at me. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know, Karatsu forum members. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And like CCing like everybody in my orbit. I mean, it's very hard when you uh, disrupt things, you know, getting back to that word. Um, but it's all, you always know when you're when when people start trying to blackball you or get you fired, or you know shut you down. That means you're on the right track. Yeah. That means <laughs> you're doing something right. <laughs> if, you, if people in power are starting to get concerned, you know look what happened. I'm not going to compare myself to Egypt revolutionaries, but it is a good parallel. Like you know, it, it Silicon Valley. What's that? A WikiLeaks. Right? Oh, WikiLeaks. That's a good question. Um, what do I personally think of WikiLeaks? I'm a journalist and a writer. You know, and I wasn't classically trained as a journalist, but I kind of think that if you come into possession of stolen or leaked documents, whatever they are, I mean, if they're leaked, they're by definition stolen, probably. Um, sure, you know, if it's in the public's interest to have that information out there, it should go out there. And p whistleblowers are awesome if they're protecting the public interest. Mm -hmm. I think there's a moral obligation to read the shit, like. You know, if it's a nuclear bomb recipe, you're maybe you don't need to publish it. Like, probably doesn't help anybody. You know, if it's the collateral murder video where, you know, it's a bunch of, you know, journalists and photographers being murdered in the streets, like, maybe we should see that, you know? Um, and maybe it will, it will help that we see that. So I'm, it, WikiLeaks is, I think, almost everybody uniformly has the same position, which is, um, if done right, it's important to have leaks. Watergate, whatever, you know, Enron, you know, um, uh, but if done wrong, and it could get people killed, like informants, you probably should just black that out. And then the guy who runs it doesn't really help that he's kind of smarmy and, you know, seems like he's an anarchist or just smug or, you know. 
if it wasn't for him, I think people would like WikiLeaks a lot more. I don't know why he's in charge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like he's. Yeah. I sort yeah, of he's so polarizing. Yeah. Yeah, I thought he was pretty convincing on 60 <coughs> Minutes, though. When he, you know, he he did a pretty. I was surprised. I mean, he did a good job. I think he's toned down his own like. But it just seems like he wants to be famous too much. You know, which I always find like. Mm, you know, like wh why are you so desperate to be famous? He's trying really hard. Yeah, it's a little too much. I don't know. What do you guys think of Wiggy Leaks? Mm -hmm. What's that? Well, the, so that, so when you say WikiLeaks, you mean like Julian Assange, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. like Julian Assange, everybody agrees, not like, not a guy you want to go to dinner with. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to go to dinner with Julian Assange? <laughs> no. Uh, no. no. <laughs> everybody think that like leaking things that inform the public of bad things happening in their world is a good idea? Yeah, of course. Everybody thinks that's a good idea. You know. Yeah, so. someone needs to leak the document that he's keeping secret to protect himself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm. The guy who wrote it's I, I tweeted. They're launching it. It, it launched, exactly. aren't they? That no. startup is coming. <laughs> I tweeted. I wish they would actually. I, I tweeted um, about one of the former WikiLeaks guys wrote a book about how leaky weeks were. Yeah. WikiLeaks works, and they're suing him to shut him up. Mm -hmm. huh. And I was like, <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> WikiLeaks is suing somebody for leaking information about WikiLeaks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's yeah, counterintuitive. Slightly let's paradoxical. <laughs> let's uh, let's go. Can we go to a happy place? Let's let's, let's go to a let's happy go to a place. place. Let's go to a happy place. Let's, go um, let's talk about your childhood. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. no, I <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, no, tell us a little bit about your background. Like, tell tell us, you know, uh, you're obviously not from LA. So tell us a little bit about where you're from. Tell us about your family. Like, is is this you know this kind of like fighter mentality, entrepreneur? You know, is that something you were born with? Is this you know? Tell tell us a little bit about that history. I grew up as a poor girl in southern, <laughs> southern Mississippi, and uh, an only child. No, not true. I did not grow up as a poor young child in Mississippi. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, my dad a bartender and owned his own bar for a while, uh, and my mom a nurse. And so I would say barely middle class would probably be, you know, sc scraping by, you know, middle class, like month-to-month yeah. -month kind of existence, uh, public school and uh, until high school, because I got... Junior high school was a bit of a battle. Um, after, after I threw somebody down a flight of stairs in junior high school, my mom said, you're going to Catholic school. Um, but that's a whole other story. It wasn't my fault, <laughs> if you can believe that. No, I was getting bullied, and I just got tired of it, and I just grabbed some kid by his, wow. he's still happening. No, I grabbed <laughs> some, I was like, stop picking on me, and I just grabbed some kid, and I just threw him, and I didn't see there was like a stairway there, and I threw him down a stairway, and like my mom came, it was, I remember like it was yesterday, uh, I'm in the principal's office, and my mom comes in, and the, <laughs> and the woman explains, like, your son threw another kid. This is like eighth grade. What is it, junior high school? Like seventh or eighth grade. And they're explaining to my mom that, like, your, your son threw a part, this other kid down a flight of stairs, and it's got a cut in the stitches, and it's really bad. And my mom goes, well, what did the other kid do that made him throw him down the stairs? And I always remember that. My mom immediately, unequivocally, supported me. Mm. Always loyal. And, yeah, so... That was my child. And, and, and no, it was a war zone. I mean, Brooklyn was a war zone in the you know, late 70s, early 80s. Like, it was like very race, racial. Like, every day there was a fight after school, and it was like white people versus Puerto Rican people versus Irish versus Italian versus black. Like, every day after school, on the top of the hill, either we were fighting Puerto Rican kids or Puerto Rican kids were fighting black kids or black kids were fighting Irish or the Irish and the Italians was the worst. I mean, you would think it was like, oh, the, they're both white. No. No, that might as well, <laughs> you know, you think like, oh, blacks and whites or whites and, his, you know, Hispanics or Hispanics and blacks. No, it was the Irish and the Italians who hated each other more than anybody. Yeah. And when you, so when you got, I mean, when you got out of high school, were you thinking, hey, I'm going to start a startup. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I, I mean, what, what, was, what was your thought process? Was it, was it, uh, I'm going to go to school? I'm going to, what, what were you thinking? Um, I had no choice. Uh, my parents couldn't afford college and I went to Fordham, which was like probably 10 grand a year at the time. Yeah. And so I went to school at night. Took five years to get my degree, and I worked full time during the uh, during the day, fixing laser printers was my first job. Anybody remember the first nice. HP LaserJet two, which um, it broke every hundred pages. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so my job was to fix those, clear the printer jam, um, fix the toner cartridge, fix the you know thing. And that was my first gig, and it was IT. And then I said, Wow, the guys over there are getting paid a lot more for doing the software side of the business and setting up the local area network. This is 1987, 1988, 1989. So I started learning how to set up Novell Networks. Anybody <laughs> ever 
I don't remember yeah, the numbers, well. or Banyan, or anybody remember RG58 cables, like the thick coaxial yeah. cables? So like, I was like underneath desks crimping cables. Like originally <laughs> when you wanted to get on the, it wasn't the internet, it was BitNet or ARPANET, or if you wanted to just get onto CC now, or God, all these other crazy pieces of software. You had to like plug in these big, thick cable jacks. Yeah. It was like putting your computer onto a um, computers didn't come with network cards. You had to put them in. So that was like my second job, and that mm. paid me a lot of money. And then, um, you know, I started um, doing that at Sony, and at Sony, mm -hmm. and I had picked Sony because Sony had uh, this multimedia concept where they had multiple media that they wanted to converge. And convergence was the talk in the early '90s, like, and they had this Magic Cap software, which was going to you were going to send these agents out onto this internet thing and it was going to come back with your travel <laughs> reservation and it was going to know what things you were interested it was basically like google alerts and yeah. you know, like other things but it was really interesting and so i went to work there doing their computer network this is in new york as well in new york yeah uh -huh. and um i um i had met some people who had started doing lotus notes programming when version 1.0 of lotus notes came out and i it was really funny it's, it's amazing how your career just like one little thing can make a difference so we had something called LexisNexis, which was law and news. Mm -hmm. And then we had Lotus Notes over here. And I was just fucking around, and I was like, I wonder if I can get what's in that database. This is before Google News, right? It's before yeah. Google. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if I can get that news into Lotus Notes. How can I do that? Hmm. And it had a cron job you could do on LexisNexis, like every day search for this, whatever. And so I was like, let me search for Sony. Let me search for Mickey Schulhoff. Let me search for Barry Wan. Let me search for Donnie Ein, all these people who worked at Sony. Then I was like, oh, I wonder if I can parse this and put it into a Lotus Notes format and make it look like, you know, and I did. Huh. And so then I made something called Jason's News, which was a Lotus Notes <laughs> application. <laughs> it was basically like, a, like an app, like for your phone. And I called it Jason's News, and it made the IT department crazy, like, because I <laughs> wouldn't use the color scheme of their Lotus Notes. And <laughs> but I, I made friends with the Lotus Notes people, so they gave me my own um, software, so I just set up my own servers, rogue yeah. servers, and anyway, they tried to get me fired a couple times. Um, <laughs> Pretty funny. Uh, what's that? And so it begins. And so it begins, yes, <laughs> my <laughs> causing trouble. So I send this Jason's app, because you could invite people to apps in Lotus Notes. I send it to all the senior executives and say, Hi, my J name is Jason. I work for this person in the law department. I was actually working for the law department managing their network uh, because they wouldn't let the IT department see that network. So, like, in it was like Michael Jackson's contract and huh. Bob Dylan's contract. <laughs> and, you know, I would never invade anybody's privacy to read those, but. Um, <laughs> it was crazy. And that was the sort of big joke. There was like all these people who worked in the contract room, you know, like getting paid a fraction of whatever. And they're supposed to keep everything secure. And like, you know, like every night we're out drinking. Did you see that this person's getting a Rolls Royce with a, you know, and a, <laughs> this many hours on the jet? You know, it's like it's pretty funny. Um, if something, if if data exists, it will be compromised. Um, typically by the IT department. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyway, long story short, I sent this to those people, and then I noticed it had a log, and Mickey Schulhoff, the CEO of the company, was in there every day reading every story about oh. Sony. Well, I mean, if you're the CEO, you want to read everything that people are saying about you. And I had all the executives reading that. Hmm. I never told the story to anybody. I never tell you the story. Tell them. Anyway, um, and so then there was a guy named Barry Wine who had built the Quilted Giraffe, most famous restaurant in New York, and then he was like a special advisor to Sony, and he had... Um, built the restaurant on the top floor of Sony. And I was obsessed with trying to get into that private restaurant because it was a sushi bar that Michael Jackson used to eat in and Janet Jackson used to, to eat in and Bob Dylan used to eat in. What's that? Had to be there. I, like, I had to get into that sushi bar. And only like the senior vice presidents were above. And I was basically like, I don't know what eight levels below a director is and two levels above the janitor, but I was yeah. sort of somewhere <laughs> in that <laughs> strata. Like assistant which, in there somewhere, right? Yeah, I was like admin, you know, it's like an IT guy, you know, whatever. It was like literally seven levels below director. Um, and so I, I did a search for Barry Wan. I found every story I've ever written about him because we yeah. had unlimited LexisNexis. I put it into a file and I sent it to him and said, maybe this will take you down through memory lane. My dad said he went to your restaurant and it was really great. Hmm. And then brrr, my phone rings. It says Barry Wan of the thing. And I was like, hello? <laughs> Hi, it's Barry Wan. Well, I really appreciate that. It was great. Um, how did you do that? And I said, oh, I did it. Oh, OK. And oh, well, you know about the internet too? And we was talking. And, and um, he goes, oh. What are you doing for lunch? I said, nothing. He goes, oh, come on upstairs. I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it gets better. I go upstairs. And <laughs> he's like, you want sushi or whatever? It's like, oh, there's a sushi bar up here? Yeah, let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> we go in there, we have sushi. And he goes, oh, this is Morimoto. He, I just hired him. And he wound up opening the sushi bar Morimoto, uh, you may have heard of. And he said, um, 
uh, we start talking to the internet, and anyway, they, this is 1993, 94. Nobody, the internet did not support this is images. Brian Gumbel internet years, right? Oh, okay. this is that was two years later. This is this is when Netscape wasn't out, and the browser was Mosaic, and Mosaic did not support images. Um, but you know, and you could you couldn't. It was all edu. Anyway, um, so. We become friends. We start yeah. talking about the internet and what's power. And we just have this like great friendship. I'm going to lunch in the Sony Club. They call the Sony Club, like two days, three days a week. Wow! And I'm seeing my <laughs> boss there. And he's like, my <laughs> boss. My boss was the general counsel, a guy named Dave Johnson. He was always super sweet to me. And he thought it was funny. So um, I go out to the West Coast in LA to help with the computers, but I time my trip around this new conference that was for the first time in 1994, 95, called E3, hmm. and it was the first version of E3, and they were going to launch something called the PlayStation. So Barry's like, I'm going to be out there. I said, like, great, we'll hang out. I said, great. So I go to hang out with Barry. He says, oh, let's you know, drive me to the thing where the PlayStation's launching. I said, sure. I pull up to the front of the Sony you know, lot where they make the movies, and the guy says, uh, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm driving for Mr. Wine. I pretended I was his driver. He goes, oh, yeah, park over there. I park over there. We go in, and Mickey Shulhoff's there. Shakes hands with me, and Michael Jackson's right there. Mm -hmm. And Mickey and Michael Jackson start playing PlayStation, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there giving Mickey Shulhoff tips on how to play Street Fighter or whatever, you know. <laughs> Next day, I'm at the Peninsula Hotel. I remember it was like yesterday. I'm carrying a copy of a book called Digital Living, um, Living Digital by Nicholas Negroponte. Mm -hmm. Being digital, sorry, being digital. Um, and Mickey Shulhoff goes, "Oh, uh, Jason, right? Yeah, uh, Barry's friend." Yeah, I said, yeah. I'm like, I'm like really nervous. Like, you know, I'm not <laughs> even supposed to meet the CEO. I'm, I'm 23 years old at the time. And he says, um, what do you think of the book? And I said, well, it's pretty basic and simple, but I think it's going to educate people on the digital revolution that's coming and the internet. He goes, oh, I'll tell Nicholas that you think his book is very simple. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, OK. So then he's like, he starts talking to me, and we're talking about the internet and everything. And I go home, and then I get a call. And hi, this is Mr. Schulhoff's office. I go, OK. Um, I'd like you to fly back with him on fly mm -hmm. back to New York with him. And I said, okay, I'm on um, Delta. What is he flying? As <laughs> 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 I long pause. <laughs> He's flying the Sony jet. I said, oh. I said, well, what do I do with my Delta ticket? It was like <laughs> 600, <laughs> it was like $600. And she goes, I remember this, like, rip it up. <laughs> I said, okay. I ripped it up. <laughs> I flew back to New York and I was on the plane and I said, there are three companies we should buy. This is Yahoo, and there's a company called Lycos, mm -hmm. and then there's this other company, and I think we could buy them for like thirty million dollars or something. And it's like, yeah, mo movies and CD-ROMs are where it's going to go. Whatever. Anyway, but it just all of a sudden was like at the top of the world. Mm. Then I joined the AOL Greenhouse um, and GNN Greenhouse. Ted Leonsis' thing in '95, wow. and built some stuff for that. And uh, away I went, and then I started the Silicon Reporter magazine. And then, you know, I was 25 years old with a magazine that. 10,000 people were getting in 1996, 97 when the internet was just Physical starting. Physical magazine, right? Physical magazine. Like and then an email newsletter. Easy, so. I wound up having 70 people work for me. We did $11.6 million in the biggest share of business and I built it off my credit cards and was, you know, king of New York, you know, in terms of in this boom internet season. Yeah. But then once the internet went bust, I went down to 10 employees uh, and to $600,000 in revenue. And uh, that was. I learned more on the way down than on the way up, certainly. And then I went from being, I always remember it because I got, I had done these interviews for this book that was going to be, it was a book that was going to be called like Digital Visionaries or you know something stupid like that, E-Visionaries, Digital Visionaries. <laughs> and so I give them like all this access and this huge thing. And then the book comes out, Digital Hustlers, how you know Generation X suckered the, you know, blah, blah. They totally changed the whole point of the book. <laughs> we went from Visionaries, the book was called Visionaries, literally. <laughs> To hustlers. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw the kid who wrote it, and I was like, what happened? And he goes, what are you doing to hustler? I said, do you know what a hustler is? That's like a guy who sells his body for sex. Like, <laughs> he's and like, there's yeah. There's some correlation there, right? Yeah, no, yeah. Well, and I was like, well, but I wasn't a fraud. And it was like, you know, how Gen, y, Gen X frauded you know, America into thinking the internet was a good investment. You know? I just sat there, and I was like, well, I thought I was doing good stuff. And I was like, fuck this. I am going to come back stronger. Yeah. I don't care. I'm yeah. going to come back stronger. I'm going to show those guys that I. And everybody was like, Calacanis, one trick pony. He got lucky with Silicon Eye Reporter, who's there, right, right, right time, you know. Um, all the journalists 
you know, tech journalists in New York at New York Times and Wall Street Journal and other publications hated me because I wasn't a classically trained journalist and had the balls to start my own magazine and put it on my credit cards and I grew it into a significant business. Yeah. And they were all like still journalists and I had 70 people working for me and they were like, you can't even spell, you know? And it's like, <laughs> I still can't spell. I mean, you guys read my emails and newsletter and tweets. Like, <laughs> fuck it, I got dyslexia, I don't care. Uh, it's the end, you know. Anyway, so it was, it was really funny because um, they all counted me out and then I just, I remember I was at the, Pat I was at the Patrick Ewing Big Nick fan, as probably many of you know, and I was at the Patrick Ewing retirement ceremony, and I had this idea that blogs were going to be big. So I got Brian Alvey, who had worked for me at Silicon Air Porter, and I said, uh, come to the Patrick Ewing retirement ceremony. And I started telling him my idea. What if you had 10 of these blogs, or 20 of them, and you did it around business verticals, you know, like you had one on Wi-Fi, because this new technology is coming out, Wi-Fi, like we yeah. just do a blog, it's like a newsletter on Wi-Fi. Hmm. And he's like, yeah, you'd have to have like 100 of them. I was like, let's do it. And he's like, well, the <coughs> blog platforms don't do it. I was like, you're a developer, you could write it. And he's like, yeah, I could. I like, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> and then we became partners on his, his, his It was funny because I, yeah, anyway, I could tell some good stories about late nights and, yeah, it was fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, one, one thing we want to ask you is we, so our audience predominantly, I would say, is a lot of founders. Yep. M many of which who you've never heard of their company. Not yet. But they're, they're working their butts off. Yep. Right? TechCrunch doesn't care about them. Mashable doesn't care about them, or they, they maybe have. They did one time, you know. Yeah. And um, you know, they will care about you when you fail, <laughs> and then and they will pounce on you. And I mean, so put yourself in those shoes, and you know, give advice to those founders. I mean, if you're in one of those situations where you're working your butt off, you're struggling to raise money, or you're just on the the last money you've got. Yep. You know, and you can't get attention. What what, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? Um. Well. Um, Perseverance, resilience, and resourcefulness are the most important traits of an entrepreneur. Resilience, probably. Uh, staying positive when you're getting your ass kicked and when you can't figure things out, being resourceful. So in the culture document for Mahalo, we have resourceful and resilient as two of the 10 words that describe our team members, and we use that to hire people. Uh, it's there for a reason. Um, people who are, aren't resourceful, people who can't get a dollar out of a nickel, yeah. Um, people who you know can't find a solution to a problem that nobody's been able to solve for 10 years, they shouldn't be entrepreneurs. Um, and if you're not resilient, where you can't stay positive and keep fighting even though you're getting your ass kicked, uh, shouldn't be entrepreneurs either. And so if you find yourself at the point where you, you're going to give up, um, you know maybe you're not cut out to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is. It takes a certain person, um, I think, and a certain perseverance. But if you persevere and you do it two or three times and you learn each time and uh, you will succeed. Uh, you miss 100% of shots you don't take, and you probably in your life will get you know, a couple swings at bat if you take them. But uh, what I find is a lot of people don't take them, um, mm -hmm. and that's the big mistake. <coughs> you're uh, not referencing Freeze Crowd, are you? No. I think he got that from me. Okay. But Freeze Crowd is pretty dope. Um, but let me tell you something. Even, at, you, you know, even the silliest entrepreneur you know, on their worst day making the stupidest product is more impressive than somebody who just punches a clock. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, that's what I always tell people. Like, you know, if you think it's a great idea and you think it could work, do you want to live, you know, 20 years from now, do you want to say, I had the same idea for Twitter, I just didn't do it, you know, like, <laughs> would you rather say I tried to compete, you know, and create something like Twitter and I failed, or I never tried? You know, you got to try, you got to swing the bat. You miss 100% of shots, you do not take. Yeah. Um, and. Michael Jordan missed more shots than anybody in the history of the NBA, and he's got more rings than you know anybody in modern times, and he's one of the best players. I mean, just do it, try, and if you f and get people around you who are good, uh, and listen to the market. You know, a lot of young. That's actually the, probably one of the harder, more nuanced things I find for younger entrepreneurs is knowing when to listen and knowing when to ignore advice, because yeah. you will get pounded with advice, right? Like I'm up here giving you advice. I'm giving you advice. Don't take advice or do take advice. I mean, is that good advice? No. Uh, <laughs> but you will get tons of advice. There's tons of books. And you have to learn, like, you know, consider the source. And, cons you know, when I started the blog company, I started to explain to people, like, no, it's going to be blogs. I'm like, what's a blog? I've actually come full circle now. If somebody understands, if, a, if the majority of people understand the idea and think it's a good idea, then I have absolutely no interest in doing it. Because it means by default that everybody's got that idea. It's an obvious idea, and it's already been tried, or it's not going to be that big. I want the idea that like 10% of the people, 5% of people go, that's brilliant, and those like really visionary people, and then like 10% go, that that could be interesting, and then the other 85% are like, I don't know, what? 
Yeah. You know, and you know, it's, it, look at human powered search, right? I have this idea for human powered search in 2007. I start pursuing mm -hmm. it, have modest success in it, uh, and everybody's like, that, I don't understand, that's crazy. And then like, finally when I realized like, wow, you know, this is, this is too hard and Google's getting too good, maybe the world doesn't need this solution, then everybody starts writing article after blog post, we need human powered search. You know? <laughs> oh, I tried that for three <laughs> years and it doesn't work. Why are you guys still writing? It's going to work, you know? Yeah. But it's, I still believe that's an idea that's going to actually happen. I just was too early, you know, and you have to know, again, like when to listen, when not to. Like, look at the iPad. Like, I think actually human powered search is my Newton. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly believe that. <laughs> I'm just way too soon. The Newton sucked. But people, a certain group of people were like really jazzed about it, mm -hmm. right? Palm Pilot, terrible, you know, <laughs> false start. But remember Palm Pilot? Let's trade. Let's try Bean. Come on. Who wants to Bean with me? You know, like there's still was, people that care around. Pop I know. If it was 1998, 1999, right now, yeah. this whole conference, this whole room would be like flipping open this green thing that looks like it's from Desert Storm. <laughs> you know, like you're gonna like you're looking for tanks with this thing. You know, like I'm yeah. about to set off like a bomb. Um, it's just all timing and iteration. I mean, look at YouTube. You know, like everybody looked at YouTube and was like, wow, video on the web. How dumb. You know, how many people tried video on the web before them? Yeah, dozens. Uh, dozens. Thousands, hundreds funded and thousands that had not been funded tried to make that work. But they just came along at the right time. Bandwidth went down and, and storage had collapsed in terms of cost. They did it in Flash, not with RealPlayer or some no plugin. They had the syndication part where you could cut and paste and put it on any site. They made it free, all of these it's different simple. pieces. Simple. It was like three or four things that just unlocked that magic. Yeah. I mean, Facebook wasn't the first social network. They just the first people to build it really in a with a great clean UX mm -hmm. that actually was stable. In fact, Facebook uh, reminds me of Friendster more than MySpace. Friendster had a very clean, crisp UI, and Facebook looks very mm -hmm. much like that. They just couldn't keep the goddamn servers up. So yeah. there's like all these lessons. Like, Friendster had kept their servers up and was fast. Would have been Facebook. There would be no MySpace. MySpace mm -hmm. could have kept their servers running and fast and had a more organized look and feel that was more professional. Could have been Facebook. There would have been no Facebook. LinkedIn, if they had let people um, um, have public profiles and let people e message people through the system instead of making messaging a cost, might have been Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's all these like, you know, Twitter. Ho tw if Twitter hosts images, how big would Facebook be right now? I don't think Facebook would be as big if I mean the images are a third of Facebook's traffic. So that's not taking anything away from their success. It's just the point is, you know, little tiny decisions along the way can make all the difference. And people are going to give you all kinds of advice. And it's your job to figure out if that person, interpret if that person's worth talking to and worth listening to or not, or, or how to interpret that advice. Yeah. And then iterate. And at the end of the day, it's all about product. All of my success in life uh, the times I've been successful, has come when I have focused on the product and made something that people connected with. Uh, Silicon Eye Reporter, Engadget, TechCrunch 50, Autoblog, Joystick. Mahalo 1.0? Maybe not. Mahalo now with the educational videos? 30 million views on the videos last month, 12 million people to the site, hundreds of comments under the you know, guitar videos on teaching people how to play guitar, hundreds of comments under every cooking video, hundreds of comments under all the... We have 26,000 videos now. We're producing 900 wow. a week. I'm going to be the largest producer of video on mm -hmm. the internet, professional video on the internet by the end of this year. We'll have, uh, we're hiring 100 more video editors to go with the 105 people we have on staff already. You know, this is going to be big. Yeah. And it's like, we're making a lot of money. Um, and we don't need to raise any more money. Like, I figured it out, you know, and just took listening. But you have to also know when to not listen. Mm -hmm. And that is the challenge. It's very hard to know. I can't give you an answer, but you have to look at the, I, I think if you always look at the product and say, are people getting value from this? And that's the hardest thing to do as an entrepreneur, because you put all this effort into building something. Is it, how do you know if it's good or not? Right. Do you use it yourself? Do your employees use it or not? Um, are people using it uh, in a repeated fashion? Are you in some way part of somebody's everyday life or not? Mm -hmm. And if you look at those kind of tests, do you use it yourself? Is your, like, for human power search, I wasn't using it myself. And I was like, well, I had all these excuses of why I wasn't using my own search engine. It's like, well, it's not complete enough yet. Okay. Um, but at the end of the day, if there's three or f what I realized at the end of the day with human power search was even if Google has three or four spammy results out of 10, that means they have six or seven good ones. And hitting the back key 
after getting one of the bad ones and finding a good one. It's not that much work. It's not actually that much work. And that's where the argument for human-powered search <coughs> fails, um, is that most people don't care, just like most people don't care about pollution in the city. People are like, oh, how could you live in New York City with all the pollution or whatever, you know? How could you live in, you know, whatever state with all the gun violence or murder? It's like people just sort of adapt to even imperfect situations. Yeah. Anyway. Hey, let's give Jason a round of applause. <laughs> we'll do that. Um, I hope that was helpful. That was very helpful. Or interesting. Yeah, let's take let's take two or three questions and then uh, and then we'll eat pizza. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so I grew up in Los Angeles, actually, <coughs> and ended up here. Yeah. Uh, because I finished grad school and it was the natural transition. Mm -hmm. I'm just um, I am actually uh, know that there's you know you know a significant uh, decent number of tech companies in Santa Monica, but I've actually never worked there or even visited yeah. any of those companies. So like. I'm curious to hear what you think about, you know, running a tech company in LA. Yeah. Working at a tech company in LA, and why you chose. <coughs> Um, LA. And Santa Monica is really kind of taken off, right? Mahalo, yeah. movie mm -hmm. clips. I mean, there's yeah. a bunch of cool startups. A lot of people there. are there now. Um, I moved to Los Angeles um, for the same reason that anybody leaves the greatest city in the world, New York, for a woman. Um, that's the only reason you would ever leave New York. Uh, I met my wife in LA, and uh, I was bi-coastal anyway, because I had an office out there. And I was doing Weblogs Inc. in New York and there, and then I met my wife and fell in love, and then started a company there. Now, having been there, I can tell you it's um, not as vibrant as the Valley or New York in terms of the tech scene and the number of people. Um, clearly, the Valley is a great place to be, and New York is equally as good, I would say, now. And it used to be maybe slightly behind, but now New York's just as good uh, as having a company in the Valley, especially in terms of funding. Like, I, w I actually think it might be easier to get funded in New York because um, there's a lot of East Coast VCs who don't want to take a five-hour flight and not a lot of great entrepreneurs. Uh, L.A. is awesome because nobody's leaving Mahalo to go to movie clips. No offense to movie clips. Um, and nobody's leaving Mahalo to go to any of the startups there. Like, I can be the big fish in the small pond. Our equity's worth more than anybody's down there. I come up here, yeah, you know, hey, if they offer me a senior vice president job at Facebook and a bucket load of stock, I gotta look at that. Mm -hmm. I'm joking, obviously, but, you know, that's serious competition. And Google and Facebook and Twitter are gonna pay literally 50% more than anybody else in Los Angeles for the same people. That's why Google's building a big office down there. Like, oh, wow, this is a this is a pond worth fishing in. Um, and it's aw an awesome place to live. I mean, Palo Alto, the food sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, but I mean, with that all these rich- expensive. No, I mean, just- Mandarin Gourmet, come on. Listen, it's gonna, you, if you tell me the great Sun restaurants dance. here, it's gonna be on one hand. Um, <laughs> it's just not as, the food is not as good as Los Angeles. That's deep, is what that does. It, it, <laughs> it, it hurts because it's true. It hurts because <laughs> it's true. You guys are going up to San Francisco to eat. What about a sandwich? How many nights do you go out here and say, like, oh, is there any place to eat that's good here? Well, what about, like, I mean, a lot of times I'll take a sandwich into the Apple store, and that's, r that's really awesome. I mean, that's a yeah. great experience. Right? I know. Down for, at for you and Robert Scoble, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> univer I mean <laughs> university looks like, it, if it was, like, developed in terms of restaurant and foodie culture, it was done by a developer. <laughs> like a literal <laughs> programmer, like, what if we had like huge sandwiches and you know, 32 ounce gulp you know, sodas? I mean, it's just fine. <laughs> anyway, um, that doesn't mean it's bad, it's just, for, exactly. Um, but LA's awesome, and you know, listen, up here you have this other advantage, which is, I mean, you throw a rock and it bounces off three developers' heads before it hits the ground, and then hits two <laughs> recruiters chasing them down the block. You know, it's like, <laughs> just like LA, it's all Hollywood all the time. Um, here it is all tech, tech all, the time, all the time, which is why I, I would have a hard time living up here because I like a little bit more diversity in my, you know. That's why I like New York a lot because New York, it's not like it's just 10 different, you, you go out to a bar, it's like, oh, you're in fashion and you're in publishing and you're in finance and you're in internet and you're in magazines and you're in, it's like everybody's in something different. Right. We have Python, Ruby, Yagala. We got all that <laughs> shit. We got PHP. <laughs> We got some Pearl, we got a Cassandra guy. <laughs> <laughs> Shit's blowing up, man. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. We got a guy doing Pascal. Madness. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, question. What do you think about Yelp and Chowhound and TripAdvisor and these other UCG sites that are, UGC sites rather, that are just so ugly and the pain point of using them has become fever pitch and how to disrupt that, uh, yeah. that space? Clearly, you are a UX consultant. Uh, no. <laughs> it's always good when they, you hear that question, like a very unique question, and they're like, 
and I'm from UXCleanUpYourWebsite.com. A <laughs> 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 little bit of background. Um, I founded and bootstrapped my last company to about yeah. 60 people, eight yeah. figures in revenue. I spent the last year trying to figure out what to do next, moved my whole yeah. family to Silicon Valley, and this, this space really interests me. And I'm yeah. Um, there is no correlation between good design and success uh, on the web. If you go down the top 100 websites uh, on Quantcast, there is some ugly shit in there. Whether it's <laughs> eBay, Craigslist, uh, Huffington Post is the, I mean, that looks like somebody threw up on, uh, <laughs> that looks like somebody threw up on USA Today. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like green and blue and red, but you know what? There's good content, uh, at least on the homepage and the sections. Uh, it's very clickable. Um, and so uh, community and content trumps the look and feel, you know, and certainly SEO um, is a messy business. So like making a really well-designed SEO page versus a really well-designed page it's two different things. Also, advertising works better when you make the page really crappy. I mean, this is one of the frustrating parts about the sort of content farm space. And I, I did a talk two weeks ago where I was just like, this is all bullshit. You know, like, it's <laughs> fuck the content. I'm out of it. I'm out. I'm out. I was like, fuck it. I'm out. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to compete with demand media anymore and all this stuff because it's just like, it's too frustrating because every time we start making more content, they're just like, oh yeah, we're, pu we're publishing 18,000 things a day. And I'm like, is there 18,000 things to say a day? I mean, and after 10 days, you've got 180,000 things. Is there anything left to say? I mean, what, what more can you say? I mean, is there, how do, I mean, how many different ways are there to cook asparagus? You know, and apparently on eHow, there's 700. <laughs> yeah, or pour milk, right? Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. So I was just like, you know what, this is, you know, I got myself in trouble at that conference too, John Patel's thing. But I was just like, you know what? It's nonsense. Everybody's got to stop going wide. Everybody's got to start going a little deeper. That's why I did, you know, the sort of video with an expert in it. It was my sort of like little lever, you know, in terms of the content space. But it sucks because if you produce one article and we spend like, we wind up spending, you know, $500 or $1,000 or $3,000 on a series of videos that are really good with an expert in them, HD, cut really nicely with question and answer, with articles. And then it's like, we got beat by about.com or eHow, which like has how to make sushi rice, buy a bag of sushi, read the instructions on the side, prepare as per instructions on the side, enjoy delicious sushi rice. <laughs> you know? The, the two big things, that, the, the two demons that Google has mm -hmm. and these content sites have, is the more you solve people's problems, the less they click on the ads. Let me say that one more time. The more you solve people's problems, the, the better a job you do at creating the content, the less people will click on the ads, the less money you'll make. Why? Because the ads are typically targeted, right? So powerful, to the content. So if you make a bad page that doesn't solve the problem, I clicking. need another page. Well, where am I going to the page? Well, it's a how to make sushi rice. Oh my god, there's a how to make sushi rice. Let me click that. <laughs> So you're, there's actually a disincentive to do a thorough job. <sighs> I mean, it's maddening. Then, if you want to spend $1,000 making a series of piano videos and you know how to play this very particularly hard song, you're better off spending $10 making 100 pages, none of which solve the problem. Flooding the Google index with eHow pages or whatever pages, you know, it's a bunch of people doing it, associated, whatever. Um, you're better off just going wide than going deep. And sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm painting with a wide brush. Sometimes they have something good, but a lot of times not. And then anybody who's creating content that has to compete with it is like, oh, I get one swing at bat, you get 100. And my one swing at bat is not as effective as your 100 because your 100 get three times as much click through. So right. it's really like it's 300 to one. Well, so aren't you, I mean, even with the shift in Mahalo, then aren't you playing a game you can't win? I mean, if these guys continue I'm to I'm changing the game though. Do you think so? I'm, I know I'm going to change the game because I am going to ride the search engines and I'm going to do it publicly and I'm going to show a page I spent $1,000 on and I'm going to compare it to the three above it and I'm, I'll email Matt Cutts and Yusuf over at Mendy, Mehdi at uh, you know, Microsoft and I'll put it on my blog and I'll tweet it. Why are these three pages ahead of us? I am going to go on a jihad <laughs> to get this problem solved. Wrong term? <laughs> Maybe not, Jihad. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go on a, no, I'm, I'm going to, it's just two, it's right, thank you, what he said, crusade. See, Jihad, Jihad, too soon, crusade, okay. Um, uh, so, if you can't win, 
I mean, this is, you know, serious Sun Tzu, Brooklyn level stuff. Like, fight the fight you can win, and if you can't fight that fight, then just change the rules of the game. <laughs> you know? Like, I'm not going to win playing basketball against somebody who's taller than me, so I'm going to foul the shit out of them until they yeah. don't want to back me up into the basket, right? Like, yeah. I'm going to make it painful every time you go and go, oh my God, I'm so sorry that I hit you in your nose. But I'm not sorry that I hit you in your nose. I'm telling you to get the fuck out of the pain and stop backing me down because you've got six inches on me and I'm 50 pounds. Yeah. I'm not sorry at all. I'm just trying to explain to you that I'm going to rake your hands and maybe hit your face one out of three times until you stop <laughs> you know, backing me in and just Is laying it really up. Is that really how you play basketball? If I have to, uh, whatever. <laughs> Let's play. We should play. I should be on my team. Though. Exactly. <laughs> Black goes great, yeah. Yeah, well, I know Do the Do we Black have anyone from Blacko's here? Sometimes we get... Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, Black CTO comes sometimes. Black, yeah, Blacko's awesome. Um, and I know the guys there, Rich and everything, um, from back when they were doing um, topics. And so there's a lot of different approaches. Like for, what they're doing is essentially vertical search, right? You, you do a search, and then you put a slash, and that gives you a subset. Google just released a Chrome extension where you can block certain browsers. Sort of the opposite of that. Uh, vertical search has been tried a lot of times, and what, ha what happens with search is you have to make something that is so much better than Google's that people will switch. The problem is you have to make something two or three times better, I'm convinced, in order to get people to switch, because the mental cost of switching is high. Everybody says it's low, like, oh, you can just switch, you can type anything. It's true. So if Google was to get worse every year than Blecko and got better every year, there would be at some point enough of a difference that people would make the change. What I found and what other people have found, and the reason why search share is so hard to move, is that there's not that much innovation left in search. What Blecko is doing has been done already. They happen to be doing it very well. And that doesn't mean that they should stop. That means they're going to hit some things that are going to be very innovative if they keep going. But nobody's going to switch off Google for a search engine that's 10 or 20% better. I know this because if you switch the logos on search engines and then have people test it, they don't know the difference. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And they will report that Google is better than Yahoo if you switch the logos. Mm -hmm. You put the Yahoo logo back on the Yahoo ones, they'll say that one's worse. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, it just follows. That people in their mind just think Google equals better. Yeah. So, I mean, that, yeah, and that, yeah, that's a lesson brand. for brand. I mean, they just have an yeah. awesome brand. And there's nothing wrong with Google. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to bash Google. What's happened is Google's process for uh, relevancy was based on the age of the domain, the number of inbound links, and the number of pages. Those three things became apparent. So people like Demand bought 11-year-old domains, put millions of pages on it, um, and got a huge number of links. And people like JCPenney go buy zillions of links like you read in the New York Times and boost it up. So it's too, it's everybody knows. The emperor, they, the emperor doesn't have any clothes. It's easy to game. I am absolutely, absolutely convinced in the next year that Google will fill out, figure out quality based on social signals and time on page. And they'll start using your browser data and other things as signals of quality, and the whole index is going to get turned upside down. That's why one year ago I pivoted Mahalo and I said, you know what? This game is over. We are, we are out of the content farm business. And I was kind of, to be totally honest, never fully in it because I always felt like I was doing content a little bit, you know, 60% as good as I did previously at Engadget or Autoblog. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, I want to have something I'm proud of at the end of the day. And I'm, how did I get in this race anyway? This is not how I do things. And I got in this crazy race with these other players. And um, when do, you, do I mean, do you think Google's going to figure it out? I mean, so, the, so they. Oh no, they they're, right? they, they, they 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 have talent bleed. They have the bureaucracy that everyone's reported on. I mean, you, you think they're it's a gonna great. There's great people there. It's a great company. And search is. La I mean, Larry Page taking over is going to change everything. Yeah. He is very, very, very competitive, and he is very, very, very smart. If Larry Page walked into this room, I'm pretty sure he's the smartest guy in the room by default. Who walks into most rooms? He's the smartest guy in the room. I mean, I've had a couple of conversations with the guy over the years. He's brilliant, and you know, like being in charge of Google means he's got all these brilliant people around him who explain really th tough things to him. So it's like, imagine if I said to you, like, oh, here's like a thousand people at your disposal to explain anything difficult to you, and you can give them tasks that solve your thesis on things. Like that's what he's got at his disposal. He can be like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. you 50 people go try you know, doing something like Blecko, and I want you 75 people to go try doing something like Mahalo, come back, explain to me what worked and what didn't, and then he just sits there and analyzes and goes, okay, yeah, we need to do this. Mm. You know, like it's, <laughs> he's got a lot of smart people there. Um, and they're absolutely gonna figure this out because as I told people many times, the, the worst thing you can do to a partner is make them look stupid. Mm. Whether that's your domestic partner, business partner, anybody, because the kind of rule, or conference partner, 
Um, <laughs> um, you make your partner look stupid, they have to respond in some way. And yeah. they have to respond by either breaking up with you or they have to respond by um, filing a lawsuit or they have to respond <laughs> by knocking you out of the index, maybe. And so I think that all the gaming of Google has now led to this movement, and that's why those New York Times articles sting so much, and they're so important. There's been now like two or three stories in the New York Times of people gaming Google. Right. And you know, when eHow goes around, they're like, we have an algorithm that tells us what to put into Google and how to rank it higher so we can make more money and what pages to make. Um, they're basically saying, like, our algorithm's smarter than Google's. We can outsmart Google. <laughs> that is not a smart thing to say. <laughs> you know, especially when they're your partner. Be nice to them, you know? Just say like, hey, we make good content, we work hard every day, and we try to help the user, like some bullshit like that. Don't say, <laughs> you, never, it's, you never get high on your own supply. Anybody ever see Scarface? Never get high on your own supply, that's a mistake. So I think some people got a little high on their supply, you start to think you're smarter than, I don't think I'm smarter than Google, I know I'm not smarter. I, me versus a Google person playing chess. What about basketball though? No, <laughs> poker. <laughs> As en me versus anybody at Google in chess, I lose. Me versus anybody at Google in poker, I'm rich. <laughs> I, I will win. So you ha again, you have to know what game you're playing, I think. And yeah. I yeah. would not play chess versus anybody at Google, no. Or write an algorithm. Hey, Jason. <coughs> I used to work for a company called Tubal. Uh, yeah. yeah I've used Tobe Mogul. Yeah, we still use absolutely. it, yeah. Absolutely. Cool company. Uh, now the content that you're doing, all this how-to content, yeah. are, are you like now going against Howcast five minutes? Yeah, um, in a way. Um, Howcast outsources their video production, right. um, and so that leads to a certain type. What we're trying to do is more like Khan Academy, and the reason why Khan Academy has made such an impression on me. Anybody know what the Khan Academy yeah. is? Okay, so Khan Academy is one guy uh, named Khan, uh, not Wrath of Khan Khan, but another Khan, <laughs> um, and he. Um, did like 3,000 videos on math. And like Khan Academy is Khan teaching you math and science and finance. One really good teacher in the same format. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing. We're finding really great teachers in the other things. We have math and stuff like that, but, uh, and then the best techniques for teaching. So where a Howcast or some of those people would outsource it or Five Men, uh, I think Five Men bought a lot of like archival things. I'm actually going to spend tens of millions of dollars over the next couple of years building these. Uh, but I've got the math figured out. I know how it will make money, and I've got the trajectory of, uh, you know, how much people are willing to pay for it, and how to solve the quadratic equation will be the same today as it is <laughs> yesterday as with tomorrow. So a lot of this stuff is evergreen, um, and so I don't think they're doing it at the scale. Also, we have Mahalo Answers, which is you know, um, pound for pound as good as Quora in terms of features. Even has a couple they don't have, and then we have articles. So we're sort of. We've studied the education space, and there's something magical that happens when you have a video that you made with an article you wrote and the ability to ask questions, and those questions get routed to those experts. It's a much tighter process. Video, article, question and answer if you didn't get it. And then there's another piece we're gonna build, which is sort of like lesson plans and exercises, which Khan is actually starting to build too. Um, and uh, it's about scale and consistency and brand. I mean, why do you read Engadget and not you know, whatever these other ones are. It's because you trust the brand and it, it's got a certain panache to it and a certain voice. So a lot of it's about voice as well. Do you get more views on YouTube versus Oh yeah, but it's 95%. I mean, it's all YouTube right now. Um, and we used TubeMogul to distribute to all of the things and it didn't matter. The, the right. YouTube is where it's at. So my philosophy is when something's working, like just, it's sort of like if you're making social games, like sure you can make it for five platforms, but Facebook's the one that's gonna matter. You can't, it's not my job to change you know, how effective YouTube is and what percentage of the market share they have. So we're putting it on there. Really, the thing that impacts it most we're finding is the credentials of the teacher. So now, I mean, it's very old school. We're getting like, we, we cast, and we cast for two things. Like, can this person present and their credentials? And if we had to pick between the two, we'll take the credentials over the pre presentation so skills. How can you apply? How can you apply? Um, we, uh, we are trying to get to scale at some categories right now. So we're focusing on music and food and video games, and then we're going to be adding, um, we have language and uh, math and science, and language is really good too. So anyway, um, you can email Jason at Mahalo. <laughs> uh, but we're doing, we have one studio down in LA, and we're building three more studios. So we'll have four studios going seven days a week making videos. Mm -hmm. We did 800, 900 videos every week for the last wow. couple of weeks. When we get this other 9,000 square feet, we'll start doing about 2,500 videos a week. Um, so 
every language teaching every other language. So if you're Chinese and want to learn Spanish and, or English, so you start thinking about all this knowledge, and then you start thinking about every language. So we've got a something. We have a video how to play Hotel California by our <coughs> guitar instructor. It's got a half million views in six months, so it's a million views a year. It'll get. It's a decent amount of money if you're making three dollars CPM. That video makes three thousand dollars a year, ten thousand dollars over three years, and it might have cost you a couple hundred dollars to make. There's pretty good economics there, and it scales because if you that vi if you do ten more Eagle songs, people are going to be linking and whipping around inside of those. So it's kind of a neat business that way. Um, but what's really interesting is that video could be in 10 languages. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to build the video platform that reaches everybody. It's already there. But the video isn't there in that language. And we look at our stats. We get more, we get on some videos more traffic non-US than US. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually every internet company in the United States will make mm -hmm. two-thirds of their money outside the United States and one-third in. So the global trend is big. So once we get to about 100,000 or 200,000 videos, we're going to start doing subtitles on them, and we're trying to figure out what's the most efficient model for doing that. But we've also started finding bilingual hosts. So we have a nurse practitioner who's now doing videos like how to wash your hands in English and in Spanish. You know, how to take your temperature in English and in Spanish. So we just do two shoots, or the same shoot, just does it in another language. Um, so we've identified a half million videos that we want to do like in the next <laughs> like two years or whatever, but we could do that in five languages. <coughs> So this has become huge numbers. Nobody's ever built video at the scale before. So mm -hmm. it's very exciting. And if you just think about it, like, would you rather learn how to make, you know, tie a bow tie or learn how to use Cassandra or program in PHP or use, anybody here ever use lynda.com? Everybody know what that is? Right. So like lynda.com is like doing it in software for a subscription. <coughs> and then you have Khan Academy doing math over here. Then you have Food Network doing food over here. What if there was one brand that taught you everything? That's the vision. And that could be a top 25 site. I mean, if Wikipedia with three million articles can be, you know, top ten site, and About.com can be top twenty, and Ehow can be top twenty-five, like, what if you had one brand that made millions of? I mean, this would work, right? <laughs> Please tell me yes. yes. <laughs> okay, good. Either that, or I'm going to be going down a three-year trail that's not going to work. <laughs> like a video you have with an expert in, it, as opposed to a ten-dollar person working from home in their underwear. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's do one more question, and then and then we'll. Uh, what? Yeah, that's a great question. I think if it's going to, I always um, had some income sources. So I mean, some people would be like, "Oh no, if it's worth doing, you know, you have to just dive all in, and they don't have to pay rent, and their dad's gave them a trust fund, and blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. They got venture capital, so like, it's like, well, fuck you, I got to pay my rent, you know." <laughs> um, so I always like to have a consulting client that paid me a disproportionate amount of money for a small amount of time, <laughs> and use that to build my businesses. Uh, as a matter of fact, my severance package when I sold, you know, venture report and all that kind of stuff let me work for a year, getting paid while I built Weblogs Inc. And, yeah. After they bought it, they were like, they took me for a walk, and like one of these hotels around here, and they were like, listen, we wanted to talk to you about what you're working on with you know, Venture Reporter and everything, and, da -da, and we don't know if we're actually, you know, your talents would be actually like properly utilized here at you know, the Dow Jones Corporation. And I was like, am I being fired? <laughs> They're like, no, no, we don't want you to look at it that way. <laughs> I was like, so I am being fired. They're like, we're going to give you like a, you know, we're gonna t we had a two-year deal with you, so there's 19 months left. We're going to give you all that. And I was like, oh, okay, we'll fire me. <laughs> they're like, well, no, no, we still want to have you as a consultant. I was like, what does that mean? That means that they're like, well, we can call you if we don't know how something works. I was like, you got it. I'm out. <laughs> I didn't tell me twice. I'm out. You're going to pay me every two weeks? And then I was like, what if you pay me in a lump sum? They're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been better. <laughs> so yeah, it's fine. I mean, you do what you got to do yeah. if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you know, and uh, you can totally do that for a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's you have to deal with competitors who don't. Sl this is why I say it's a, a younger person's game, typically. Like, and um, you know, if you've got two kids and you can work forty hours a week on your startup, it's going to be harder than if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you don't sleep and you, you know don't need human interaction and whatever. <laughs> and, you know, uh, however Jesse Eisenberg played him. He does have a girlfriend. Come yes, on. He does have a girlfriend. Yes. That is correct. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know that that's true. I saw his status. <laughs> hey, let's give Jason round, another round of applause. He's actually turned into a... I give a I, you know, I gave him a lot of heck because of the privacy issues, but I have to say he's... Uh, he's, he's become a more mature, I mean, obviously, wildly successful um, and awesome that he's done what he's done. But he actually is thinking about what they're doing now. 
you know, I'm, it's sad that it took like congressmen emailing him and people like, you know, pundits berating him about the privacy stuff. But yeah. I give him credit for listening and changing a whole lot. Um, he, I mean, they, they have a much different approach at Facebook now to violating people's privacy and all that kind of stuff. They're behaving much better. Well, I think I think he's really, I mean, the greatest thing that I see from him is that he's influenced this whole another wave of entrepreneurs who aren't focused on just selling out. You know, you look yeah. at the, the Facebook mafia oh, yeah. now, the one common thread of all those guys other than Facebook is that none of those guys want to sell. It's probably because they're all rich. You know, I don't know if it is It's or not, easy to not sell you when know. you are rich. Right. So <laughs> you people are like, oh my God, you sold Weblogs Inc. after 18 months. You know, oh wow, why did you sell? I'm like, I had $10,000 left in my account. And <laughs> They offered thirty million dollars. What would you do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What part of this equation Stop. am I missing? <laughs> like, take the money. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, I, I, I sort of feel like it's actually kind of obnoxious. Like, these people are like, oh, it's not about money. It's like bullshit. It's not about money. I mean, there's venture capitalists here. This is venture capital. Like, look at the words. <laughs> you know, like they want you to make a venture. Here's capital for it. Like, exits is what it's all about. Like, anybody who says this industry is not about money. Is lying, you know. Oh, I just do this because I like to innovate, you know, and <laughs> whatever. And I'm just standing here to, li you know. It's like it's anybody who says it's lies. This, this is like a gold rush and about making great stuff mm -hmm. and making money. It doesn't mean that you don't care. I mean, listen, I'm. I think the internet is the greatest liberating force in the world, for peace, for democracy, for personal freedom, and I love it for all those reasons. And I think it's the most amazing business opportunity for you, and for everybody in this room to go, you know, fulfill their dreams, make a lot of money take care of their families, take care of their families' families, and, 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 and prosper, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's like this yeah. weird, like, <clears throat> you know, like, if they offer you $100 million, I mean, just take it, for God's sake. <laughs> Jesus, take the money. <laughs> Especially, I, I think that some of these young entrepreneurs get bad advice sometimes, where they're like, don't take the money. And I'm like, point cast, you know, anyone? Like, do you remember all these people who didn't take the money? Like, they don't remember the people who didn't take the money and then got none. Right. Like, I, but there is a slight difference now that you can take some money off the table because of these, you know, friendly founder rounds, which I think is awesome. So I do think that's like, you know, if you want to keep a Matt Mullenweg around, like saying like, oh yeah, in the next round we're going to give you like X millions of dollars or Kevin Rose or whatever. Right. That is very smart of the VCs to get them to go for the bigger opportunity. But last time I checked, WordPress and Dig haven't sold yet. And if they, the only money they made was when they did that C round, both of them, I think, made some money, got, some, got to sell some on the expert. That may be the only money they ever take out. Right. And if that's the case, you might be like, wow, your company was worth $100 million at one point, and you owned 30% of it, 40% of it, and you got to take out $2 million. And he, talked, and he talked about that, right? And you could just see it on his face where, you know, I mean, he may, I can't remember exactly. He may have even said, you know, we should have done it. But you could just see there was this, you know, this kind of, you know, self-reflection of, you know, Anybody, man, it, w it was there, right? By not selling when you're offered a disproportionate amount of money, um, in a way, you're like, I'm not going to have another good idea. What about Groupon? Because, I mean, that's what is that? an incredible amount of money. <laughs> 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 hey, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a unique moment in time. I don't think that there's a bubble because Groupon's yeah. an exceptional business. All these, bi all these businesses that are going public, LinkedIn, yeah. Facebook, Twitter. I mean, these are the real deal businesses. This is all the promise of Web 1.0 actually fulfilled. Uh, with real revenue and real profits and real margins and real scalable mm -hmm. businesses. And something has happened in those 10 years, which is people are willing to take their credit cards out. Everybody's on the internet. Everybody's on the internet twice because they're on their mobile phone as well. They're going to be on three times because their phone, their television's going to be on. And it's spreading as a global phenomenon in a very rapid pace mm -hmm. in English, you know, and, or easy to translate. So this, these companies are going to be huge. It's, there's, there's no bubble right now, except maybe in angel financing where valuations are, you know, double what they should be, a triple, you know, like, it should be angel round should be a million, two million, three million dollars, not six, seven, eight million dollars. I mean, it doesn't make sense for angels to invest in that. I've sort of slowed down and decided to sit it out. Like I'm not going to participate in that kind of round, um, unless I get advisor shares or something that make up for it. And that does happen. Um, but uh, it's going to be an awesome two or three years. I mean, when these companies go public, it's going to be awesome. The, the U.S. economy is going to be awesome for the next 30 months. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, housing has just hit the bottom, right? People are starting to buy houses with cash in Arizona, Florida, and Vegas. They're literally coming and be like, oh, you want 120? I'll give you 60 million, 60,000 in cash. And people are like, how about eight? And they're like, 65, sold, boom. <laughs> like, it's happening all over the place. So that's when you know you're at the bottom is when people start buying like that. And um, these are the real deal companies. They're going to triple in size, double in size. And it's going to create a lot of jobs. Um, hopefully, some people will be able to retrain to code 
PHP or whatever and yeah. get their jobs. But it's, this is go it's going to be an awesome 30 month run. <coughs> so I don't. I think Groupon going public is a good call. I don't think there's much downside risk there. There's very little downside risk when you have an epic company. It's those tweeners, like Dig. It's a tweener, you know. Like mm -hmm. it's it's something that's got a lot of value inside of a bigger enterprise, or you know, on its own, it's got decent value, or Weblogs Inc. But you know, does it have the ability to become a billion dollar business? Weblogs Inc. Dig, they don't. Yeah. Uh, Huffington Post didn't. You know, I think Huffington Post is a perfect example of somebody selling at the peak. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's not going to get. I mean, to make it a little bit bigger, but that's a really good price. Take it. Yeah. That's why they did take it. Um, if you have something like Facebook that's growing like this and you can't see the end of it, of course don't sell. Group one is growing like this, you can't see the end of it, and people are throwing free money at you. Like, here, let me give you a billion dollars extra to go play with. It's like, okay, well then I'll stay in the game. Yeah. It's like when you got a big chack of stack of chips in front of you in a tournament. You know, you can you can play some marginal hands, you can be a little risky, expand your range of hands a little yeah, bit, get a little bit cute. You know, if you're in a tournament, you can basically take a little more risk and, and maybe get some big payoff. But that could also make you unfocused, and sometimes you do need to get up from the table and cash in those chips. Yeah. Hopefully, people won't get burned. I feel bad. I always feel bad when I see entrepreneurs who like had a chance to exit and didn't. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Um, I mean, I, my first company I offered twenty million dollars for, it and I didn't take it, and I wound up getting much, much, much like under a million dollars less, yeah. and that burned me for a long time, especially because that was the money I was going to take care of my mom yeah, and but dad. You learned from it. And you didn't ma make that decision. Correct. The next time I was like, what? Huh? How much? What? I'm out. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, did the bank, did it clear? What, the wire cleared? I'm out. <laughs> but now I'm going long, so you know, now I'm like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to, I'm gonna build a top 25 site. I mean, if it kills me, I'm 170 now. I, wouldn't, I, hope, I mean, it's gotta drop a zero, right? How hard could that be? Well, I think, I think too, you know, something about you that, that I appreciate and, and appreciate about guys that are like this is that, you know, you, you do it once, it's successful, you know, you don't just go live in, in Maui six months out of the year. You know, you you you. I feel like you you could be an entrepreneur. You know, of these random companies you're starting for the next twenty or thirty years. You're not. You know, trying. No, to I, get love up on Sam Hill I love the game. I love the game. And uh, you know, there's a certain class of guys that are like that. That that uh, you know, I really appreciate. And, and uh, I think it's cool. I don't think there's a lot of people that are like that. So. We're only probably in the third or fourth inning of of the internet revolution. As much as has been accomplished, I would say probably. But usually everybody leaves by like the sixth or seventh, right? <laughs> so. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be, it could be, uh, hey, we could have extra innings. But um, it's, uh, there's still a lot left to be done when you think about it. So I think it's going to be just an awesome three. This is gonna be the, these are going to be two or three of the best years to be an entrepreneur. It could be better than, it's, it's already better than it was in 99, 2000 for those of us around because now it's got actual substance underneath it. Whereas before, that everything was getting elevated and it was like, Oh wow, we're just going to push you all the way up to this like hundred foot height, and there's nothing under you. So when the, you know the rug will be pulled out, and you will fall hundred feet, yeah. and you will die. Um, and now it's just like, oh, everything's getting elevated based on revenue. Oh, that seems to be a good way to elevate things. Like <laughs> Mahalo doesn't have 105 people because we're blowing through more venture capital. It is 105 people because we're making money, yeah. um, and I'm adding 100 people because I see an opportunity to make more money, uh, and I don't need to raise money. Like. That's a good time in the business when money can be made and real businesses can be made. That's why Groupon's growing. That's why Facebook's growing. These are profitable companies. Yeah. You know, when profitable companies um, go public and, and grow like this, that's a good sign for the economy. You know, these aren't these companies aren't losing hundreds of millions. That's why always people like journalists who journalists are people who generally can't work in regular jobs or start companies. You know, like I was one. Like I watched them. Like. They're usually fuck ups. Um, uh, not all of them, but like they usually. It's like they don't. I shouldn't say fuck ups. Um, that's, that's a little bit um, harsh. Um, they're, they're, they're like, they couldn't cut it running their own business, so then they criticize other people's businesses. You know, it, it's like sports writers. You know, like you see this guy, he's like a sports writer. You know, it's like Lupica's like this little nerd, and he's got the glasses, and then this other guy's like 80 pounds overweight, and he's like, they're like talking about LeBron James. You know, like, oh, he didn't put all his effort in tonight. It's like, you haven't put your effort into anything since you were in <laughs> high school. Like, you're putting your effort into like the cheese dip, you know, like, <laughs> LeBron James played 48 minutes, he's like, he's got 40 points, you know. How many, what effort do you ever put in? <laughs> you know, like, ah, yeah, this guy, that's what journalists, that's what pisses me off. Sometimes I'm like, oh my God, like this business isn't even profitable, you know, like, oh, you know, Tesla is like, you know, they had a loss and, you know, it's like, they're building electric cars, you know, like, <laughs> electric cars, like we're gonna drive in cars and run on electricity, like, this is awesome. Like the fact that anybody's doing it ever. Yeah. Like, and you're gonna criticize it? Like, it's working. People are driving in electric cars. And they're gonna make 20,000 electric cars a year. And then we don't need oil. And we can have solar panels. Like, 
And then there's like journalism, the Motley Fool's like, this is the most overstocked, this stock is that, and this company has lost money, and I, you know, there's plenty of coal, and uh, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> can we have some respect for the entrepreneur who has people, like, driving electric cars, you know, like, can we revel in that for a moment? Like, you don't have to hate on everything. Like, yeah. the journalists are always hating on everything. That's why with the, you know, I don't know if you guys read my newsletter or whatever, it's like, it's like a celebration of, all the great shit that's going on. It's not bullshit, it's just you can choose to appreciate the virtues and, and the things that are great about a company and an entrepreneur. And you don't have to manufacture like these bad stories. Like I feel like everybody in journalis journalism is so lost. They're like, we have to make this person who's doing great shit into, uh, you know, we have to write an anti-Groupon story. Like everybody wants to write the anti-Groupon story. Why? Well, that you're successful. Wait a second. <laughs> what, wait, I thought you were a journalist. You gotta be fair and balanced. Yeah, well, what if the story is Groupon kicks ass? Yeah, but there's one guy we found who got too many people to come to a store and, uh, you know, too many of them, you know, didn't order, like, an extra chicken soup, so we're going to write a story about how this one guy, I'm like, really, they found one person who was upset, and they write a Wall Street Journal story about it. How about the hundreds of thousands of people who've used the Groupon and love it and the thousands of restaurants that are on waiting lists to use it and they have a nine-month waiting list in months yeah. in most cities? Like, Oh, we have to be fair and balanced. You know, it's like, it's, it's not fair and balanced. It's like, we have to get click throughs on tech meme to, you know, let's make some shit up to. Anyway, ignore that if you're an entrepreneur. The press is, by definition, anything written in the press is something that is in the review mirror. They're writing about something they don't understand typically and putting it into the house of mirrors and making it into what they need to get the headline to do what they want that headline to do. And a lot of times the person who writes the headline who writes the headline is not the person who writes the story, and the person who writes the story is really pissed off about the headline, which tells you something. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how many times I heard that, like, oh my God, I'm really, so I, Jason, I'm really sorry about the headline. I hope the story was good. Yeah, the story was great, but the headline said I was a douche. You know, <laughs> I didn't write the headline. I'm like, yeah, but you talk about how awesome I am in the story. Yeah, but our, you know, our editor thought, Jason is a douche, was a little snappier. It would, it would. <laughs> Fair enough, it is. The click-throughs were better, for sure. Yeah, the click-throughs were better. You yeah. know, it's like, I'm always talking to Henry Blodgett about Business Insider, I'm like, hmm. You know, like you take my email newsletter and you republish it and then you put this headline on that's outrageous, you know? He's like, yeah, we get a lot of click throughs for that. I'm like, no, no, I'm, ups awesome. I'm upset. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, well, I didn't do it. <laughs> that's one of my interns. <laughs> Can I, I'm, so, I'm you sorry, eat can the I pizza. cut you off? He's really upset we're, about the pizza. I'm sorry, we're way over. So let's give Jason one yeah. more round of applause. Come up after us.